I'm going to read the first chapter again. It's so long, but we'll get through it, I think. And after looking at the background and history from last week, we're going to jump into studying this week. And I'm still awfully scared. Okay, yeah, we got it. In the first year, and this is Ezra 1.1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The Lord put it into the mind of King Cyrus to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom and to put it in writing. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Whoever is among his people, may his God be with him. And may he go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let every survivor wherever he lives be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, and livestock along with a free will offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. So the family leaders of Judah and Benjamin, along with the priests and Levites, everyone God had motivated, prepared to go up and rebuild the Lord's house in Jerusalem. All their neighbors supported them with silver articles, gold goods, livestock, and valuables, in addition to all that was given as a free will offering. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and had placed in the house of his gods. King Cyrus of Persia had them brought out under the supervision of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This was the inventory, 30 gold basins, 1,000 silver basins, 29 silver knives, 30 gold bowls, 410 various silver bowls, and 1,000 other articles. The gold and silver articles totaled 5,400. Sheshbazar brought all of them with the exiles when the exiles went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Okay, as we saw last week, this is almost verbatim, the last two verses of Chronicles 2. And this both tells us the time is at the end of the Babylonian exile without any question about it. And it also adds the importance to the story because repetition in Hebrew is a mode of adding emphasis. Isaiah 6, 3, where you read, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. That's a good example of this. The repetition of holy isn't to make a good hymn or worship song, although it does, but it's saying that the Lord of hosts is the holiest. If you get three reputations, it's maxing out. So let's start on these first few verses, recognizing, ah, it's the microphone, recognizing they are important and they are being emphasized. If you remember our history from last week, Cyrus, Cyrus the Great was the king of Persia, and in the fall of 539 BC, Cyrus finally captured Babylon, taking control of all of the territory that Babylon had controlled up to that point. The siege of Babylon is what we read about in Daniel 5, and Daniel survived the entire captivity, which is pretty impressive since it lasted for 70 years. Belshazzar's feast, or the story that we often refer to as the writing on the wall, tells how Belshazzar holds a great feast, drinks from the vessels that have been looted in the destruction of the first temple, and a hand appears on the wall and writes, and nobody can interpret it. Uh, so Belshazzar finally calls on Daniel after the queen advises him that he's a sharp old dude, renowned for his wisdom, and Daniel reads the message and interprets it. And it says, God has numbered Belshazzar's days. He's been weighed and found wanting, and his kingdom will be given to the Medes and the Persians. Cyrus's army was able to take this unassailable city by rerouting the river and going in through the riverbed under the wall. Uh, Cyrus had become the king of Anshan, and we're repeating this for a reason I get to shortly. 
when his father died. And he, this was a group that was a vassal state of the Medes. So he was under the, the Medes, in effect. Well, he led a revolt, obtained freedom for the people, and he began winning other Persians over to his side. When he attacked the Medes, who were the overseers of Persia, and had them subdued by 549, and then in 546, they actually gave him the crown of the Medes, but that didn't really impress him. He wanted to be the king of Persia, and that's what he claimed for himself at that point. And then he went on other battles, finally coming to Babylon, which is some six years later. And we're getting to verse 1, which tells us, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. Okay, as we saw in the history, Cyrus is the king of Persia for some six years at that point, prior to the fall of Babylon. But it's the first year of the rule of Cyrus over the Israelites. So that might be something that looks like it's a contradiction, but it is not. It is true for the Jews in both Babylon and in Judah and Israel that this is the first year of the king of Persia. When Cyrus became the king, he had no impact on the Jews when he first became king. So we read that as his, the first year of his rule over the Jews. And that is when Jeremiah's prophecy is fulfilled. And that's 539 B.C. for those that love dates. I don't because I forget them. Let's look at the passage from Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 25, verses 8 through 14, where this is prophesied. Starting in verse 8, chapter 25. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon the land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make slaves, even of them, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. First take note that the prophecy was absolutely accurate on predicting the 70 years, and it mentioned it twice, just in case you missed it the first time. So they were under 70 years of Babylon's exile and tyranny, and it was a pretty rough period. History and biblical prophecy are in agreement here. But more important, I have a question for you. In, Jeremiah, uh, in Jeremiah's prophecy, God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. You might have heard me emphasize that. What does that mean? What does it mean to be God's servant? You can jump in here if you like. A servant does what his master tells him to do. Nebuchadnezzar had some iffy times with dealing with God. No, he was the greatest of all the Babylonian kings. There were others. And he's much as Cyrus was the greatest of the Persian, he was the greatest of the Babylonians. And he was called God's servant more than once by Daniel. Did he worship the one true God? The absolute 
definite answer to that is maybe. He did sometimes, and it often took considerable evidence to convince him to do that, like the fiery pit and the lion's den and being crazy for seven years. So God convinced him to be a servant when it wasn't his will. But did he recognize God's power? Yes. Did he accept God as his own? We don't know. Recognizing God's power and submitting to it is not, it, is, it may be being a servant, but it's not what we want to have happen in our lives. Satan recognized God's power. If we recognize his love and what he has done for us, we're his servants willingly. Otherwise, we're his servants when he needs us, whether we believe in him or not. All right, regardless of whether or not Nebi recognized God's salvation or not, I gave him a nickname because I get tired of saying Nebuchadnezzar, and it will take us a lot longer tonight to finish if we keep doing that. But except for the explanation, probably blew all the time I saved. But anyway, we don't know whether he received God's salvation or not, but he definitely was a servant of God. The Bible says it. We see it in the scripture. Historically and biblically, it's unquestionable that Nebi exercised and sometimes abused great power. And he also had a tremendous ego. That doesn't keep us from salvation for those of us that suffer with those things. I don't have the great power, but I got a pretty big ego. But it wouldn't keep him either. He could very well have been one that accepted God as his sovereign Lord. The only certainty in this passage that we see is that God used him. And he used Babylon for his purposes. He had a plan. He processed it. He took into account who he was dealing with. And I don't like using the word used but it's a whole lot better than the word utilize, which I disdain. So God used Nebuchadnezzar. He used Cyrus. We're going to see that. The, and that brings us to Cyrus, which gets us back to Ezra. And as you may have figured out last week, he's kind of a hero of mine. I like Cyrus. But in that verse second half of the first verse it says the Lord put into the mind of King Cyrus to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom and to put it in writing and that was significant that he put it in writing that meant he wasn't going to be able to go back on what he promised the Lord put that in his mind and whether that means he used mind control manipulated him. I don't really like that one. Whether it means he gave him this idea, I do like that one. And sometimes that's the way I think I hear from God. Sometimes it was my idea and I'm trying to pin it on God. But that one's my personal favorite for Cyrus, but it can be kind of nebulous when we're talking about it. It could also be that he spoke directly to Cyrus and told him to make this declaration of freedom and support for the Israelites. We're not really sure. And again, we get to, was Cyrus a true believer in God? And as I said last week, being a fan, I kind of hope so. But again, the answer is a resounding maybe. And there's probably less evidence for him than there is for Nebuchadnezzar. Did God use King Cyrus to accomplish his purposes? Absolutely. So here's your first life lesson. Believer or pagan, we are all God's servants, and he uses us for his glory and for our good. Now we know the scripture that said all things are created for good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. 
But I see no evidence anywhere in the Bible where God using you doesn't give you a chance to be one of those called according to his purposes. So with Cyrus, with Nebuchadnezzar, God using them was to their advantage. And that, I think that's true of pagans today. This may be our only life lesson, although I've jumped ahead, so I know it's not. But at this point, when I was studying, I was saying, what else is there here? So let's see where the scripture took me in our study here. So continuing on in verse 2, whipping right along. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and is appointed to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Whoever is among his people, may his God be with him, and may he go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let every survivor, wherever he lives, be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, and livestock, along with a free will offering for the house of the God of Jerusalem. All right, and I spoke about Cyrus growing on me last week. I initially viewed him as arrogant in verse 2 in the way he described himself, that it was impressive that God gave him, it was impressive that God, he gave God credit for all that he accomplished, but he basically said he was ruling over all the earth. And if you remember, and this is a total aside rabbit trail, if you remember I threw out a quote I liked, but I didn't remember where it came from, that uh, I did search that and I found it online. And it came from a very short-lived TV Western when I was in junior high school, which was probably before some of you were around. And it's, the name of the series was The Guns of Will Sonnet, and it starred Walter Brennan. And he was Will Sonnet, and he was old then. I'm pretty sure he's dead now. In fact, I know he died some number of years ago. But Walter Brennan was big on TV in the 60s and 70s. But in this show, he was a grandfather. He was an older man in the show. And he would meet people and say, you know, uh, he was very good with firearms. And he'd speak to strangers about this in sort of an intimidating way. In the first episode, he mentions that, he mentioned that his son is an expert with guns. And his grandson is better than that. And then he continues, and I'm better than both of them. No brag, just fact. And that's where I came to with Cyrus. No brag, just fact. He was ruling over virtually the known world at that time. And there's no extra charge for that trivia, but it drove me nuts until I finally tracked it down. And that was apparently the first one, and I did like that show when I was a kid, but I didn't remember it being Walter Brennan. And also, my liking a Western on TV is a kiss of death. There was another great one a couple years later when I was in high school called Alias Smith and Jones. Anybody ever heard of it? One person. That's because I killed it. But two, I love that show. But anyway, back to Cyrus. The proclamation was Cyrus's, but it was at God's command, so it was God's. And Cyrus says that God had commanded him to do it. He commanded him, Cyrus, to build a house for God in Jerusalem. Now, why is this house of God not the second temple? Was a question I ran into and struggled with for a while. The second temple is some 500 years later when Herod builds it. This one, I mean, it's very clear in the Bible it did eventually get completed, not during Cyrus's lifetime, but because of what Cyrus did, this temple was completed. But I could find no explanation anywhere that, of why it wasn't considered the second temple. I, I've got my go-to guy here that may know, but... <laughs> 
It just, that was, I got baffled a few times at this, which it looked like a pretty straightforward passage when I started. I thought I'd find an easy answer, but I didn't. I sort of speculated that the fact it wasn't built quickly probably impacted that, but, yeah, yeah. it, well, yeah, Herod, I guess, was slower than this one, but his was a bit more impressive. But we, I mean, we call Solomon's temple the first temple, and then we've got this, and though there were survivors that had seen the first temple, and I think in Ezra 3, somebody will be teaching about that. But those that had seen Solomon's temple and then saw the completion of this temple mostly wept. They were, they were disheartened by the fact that it was so far short of the previous glory. I also wondered if maybe it didn't get designated as a temple to God because Cyrus was such a driving force in doing it. And he is favored by the Jews, but he was not Jewish. But ultimately, poor replica or a pagan having to do with it, I don't know. And I finally gave up on that struggle. Another point I want you to see is the different ways Cyrus refers to God in this short passage. He says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. That sounds to me like someone that believes in God, trusts in God, understands God, loves God. And the way that's written, I want to say Cyrus is belongs to God in the strictest sense of the world. So is this text a proof of Cyrus worshiping the God of Israel? Not necessarily, because we get a little bit further and we read him saying, whoever is among his people, may his God be with him and may he go to Jerusalem and Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, again recognizing it, but now it's his, yours, the God who is in Jerusalem. He's also locating God in one place. So that changes the whole tone from it being my God in verse 2 to being your or their God in verse 3. And we spoke last week about context and how important it was that I gave you D.A. Carson's quote, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text, which is a lot of texts saying that if you snatch out one verse, you're basically trying to prove your point with it, ultimately. If you, you need to take all text within the overall context of that area. So if you wanted to say Cyrus was saved, you go to verse 2. If you want to say he wasn't saved, you go to verse 3. But we can't do that. And this was struck me as a really simple illustration of that. You know, you can't snatch out what you like in the Bible and leave out what you don't like. It's all together. Okay, and I gave you that, I think, more or less as a life lesson last week, so I'm not going to do that again this week, but I sort of got one out of left, left field and life lesson two from these two verses is, be careful how you use and how you listen to possessive pronouns. They can reveal a lot about your hearts. That's really a stretch for grabbing a life lesson, but... That's what was on my heart in that. And most of you, I'm sure, have heard PD talk about people when they're talking about the church. Are they saying we or are they saying you? And that will tell you a lot about whether they consider themselves to be part of this body or not. And those possessive pronouns, the way we use them, can reveal things to us if we pay attention. I've caught myself saying 
you when it really was we on more than one occasion. So be careful how you use and listen to possessive pronouns. They reveal your heart. All right, zipping right along, all the way to verse 4 now. Let every survivor, wherever he lives, and that's significant, be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, and livestock, along with a freewill offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. Every survivor, wherever he lives. That we talked about, you know, the exile and said that the majority of Jews were not shipped off to Babylon, but they were scattered all over the place. This is a far-reaching order for all the pagans everywhere in the kingdoms to assist the Jews. And that makes it, at least to me, far more powerful that this is an order from a king that may or may not have followed God, but he was doing what God told him to do in that. And telling all the people to do that, whether they were fond of the Jews or not. And continuing in verse 5, so the family leaders of Judah and Benjamin, along with the priests and Levites, everyone God had motivated, prepared to go up and rebuild the Lord's house in Jerusalem. And all their neighbors supported them with silver articles, gold, goods, livestock, and valuables, in addition to all that was given as a freewill offering. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the Lord's house on to the end there. And, well, I guess I need to read this part. <coughs> King Cyrus of Persia had them brought out under the supervision of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. The two things I want to take note of in this part of the passage, two major things, are obedience and accountability. Everyone responded to the king's and ultimately to God's command. And I don't use the term everyone lightly. I don't like absolutes, so everyone bothers me. I know there had to be some exceptions. But, because, but I do assume the Bible is correct in this, and the Bible doesn't list exceptions in this. It does use the term everyone. There's one caveat to that. It's everyone God had motivated, but that's for the believers, the ones that have been motivated to go back and rebuild the castle. So that's for the Jewish folks. And ultimately, if God didn't motivate them to go, they too are being obedient if they stay. We're not all called to go out in the mission field. Some of us stay. So we need to listen for that call of God. But there is no caveat listed for the unbelievers in this, for the pagans. Every neighbor supported them. Now, did they do it out of love for the Jews? Unlikely. Did they do it out of obedience to the king? Probably. Did they know the king was being obedient to God? Probably not. But they were being obedient to the king who was being obedient to God. So everyone was obedient to that in the kingdom. Possibly the most important one of all, if we look at it, King Cyrus continues in his obedience. He didn't just make the de declaration and leave it at that. He sets the example. And he does that by returning all of the plunder from Solomon's temple that had fallen into his possession from Nebuchadnezzar and that is not insignificant also I want to note that Nebuchadnezzar had placed these items in the house of his gods which does imply that he may not have converted but we don't know where that is in the sequence of time so we can't, still can't say with any kind of absolute authority whether or not Nebuchadnezzar was converted I want to think he was too. But when we take this sort of thing out of context, it, we can make it definitive if we take it out of context. 
when we put things in context, there's many, many things that we have to look at. And you need your points, rein your points reinforced multiple ways. All righty. I'm actually getting through this a little quicker than I expected, so we might have some discussion time. And finally, in this section, we see accountability. With the transfer of these valuable items, at least two men were counting and responsible for the safekeeping of the temple goods. And so I'm going to pull the trigger on the third life lesson out of that. And we're, we're looking at all the commoners that were pagans up to the king, who we're not sure about, to the Jews, all being called by God. So the life lesson here is, regardless of our status in life, God calls us to obedience and to accountability. In the case of the temple goods, one was Jewish, one was not. But they were all, we are all called to God, to obedience to God and accountability. And finally, we'll close with verses 9 through 11. The inventory, exciting stuff. And for me, this was a truly disturbing passion, passage. Has anybody else got some OCD in them? I'll, if, you, if you do, I'm going to show you why this passage should really bother you. All right, starting in verse 9. This was the inventory. 30 gold basins, 1,000 silver basins, 29 silver knives, 30 gold bowls, 410 various silver bowls, and 1,000 other articles. The gold and silver articles totaled 5,400. Shesh Bazar brought all of them when the exiles went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. All righty, let me show you how disturbing this truly is to me and maybe to some of you. And if you aren't disturbed by it, now you can join me in my misery. 30 gold basins, 30 gold bowls, only 29 silver knives. What? I mean, 30 and 30, we're rounding. Okay, I can deal with that. But we get very specific on 29, so now 30 and 30 have to be 30, and this is only 29. Did somebody snitch one silver knife instead of taking a gold bowl, which would be worth a whole bunch more? They took a silver knife thinking it may not be noticed. That bothered me. It wasn't worth that much. I mean, silver is nice, but it isn't gold. That bugs me some but there's something that's so much worse that it pales in comparison there. This was the inventory. It didn't say it was part of the inventory. It implies it's the whole inventory. 30 gold basins, 1,000 silver basins, a specific inventory, 29 silver knives, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls, and 1,000 other articles. That's 30 silver and 1,000 gold basins. That's 29 silver knives, 30 gold and 410 silver bowls, and 1,000 other assorted items. That adds up to 2,499 silver and gold items. Now, if we didn't have 1,000 assorted, I would have said, okay, and there was some other stuff too, but they've already given us the other stuff, and that's 1,000 items. So we could say there's a bunch more stuff and just leave it at that, but that's not what's in there. Assorted items should include all the other stuff. Do you agree with me on that? You don't care, okay. The kicker is then, the gold and silver articles totaled 5,400. That's also very clear. Might have been rounded to the nearest hundred, but wait, where are the other 2,901 items. Because if we add up all those other things, it comes up to 2,499, and then we hear the total is 5,400. That annoyed me. I did the bath, and I expect some precision from the Bible. Did they leave out the cups, spoons, and forks as not being part of the quote unquote assorted? Because those things seem to go with the rest of the items. Maybe that was it. 
That's where I started. Inquiring minds want to know this. I then got deeply contemplative, and I decided that like, and I, I'll explain a little bit of this since we have time, but Aristotelian logic is, comes from the Greeks primarily, and that's how we, as in our culture, think of things. You have this or you have that. It's A or it's B. It can't be A and B. With Hebrew logic, that's not the case. Instead of either or, Hebrew logic is more both and. Jesus is a man, Jesus is God. How does that happen? Aristotelian logic messes with us on that one. For Hebrews, it's perfectly natural. It's God. He can do whatever he wants. I went there and I said, okay, if we've got that in logic, maybe we have it in math. And it's Greek math that says one plus one is two. And in Hebrew math, maybe one plus one can be three. I don't know. I've never heard that before, but I came up with that. Then I finally received a word from God, at least I think it was on this. And it really, I mean, it did bother me. I'm not I'm being a little silly here and how much it bothered me. But I wanted that to work, and it didn't. And so, and the voice I heard that I think was God sounded sort of like an irritated friend speaking to me about something that I'm obsessing over. And it went something like this last life lesson. And God is our friend. I'll give I mean, I accept that. I don't think he's ever irritated with us, or he'd always be irritated with us. But again, that might be not him. He might be irritated with us all the time and happy with us all the time. I don't know. Again, we get to that weird logic. Last life lesson. Sometimes God says, get over it. It isn't that important, and you don't have to know. And that was kind of what I heard at the close of this study. And that might be the most important life lesson of all because we can obsess on things that God doesn't want us worrying about. He's got them taken care of. So, um, I might have nailed it on the number of people. I think I printed 12 of those life lessons. I'll pass them out now, but let's pray. Then you can get into little groups of three or four. But it has to be either three or four because 12 is divisible by three and four evenly. So we can't have groups of four and three or we'll have to have groups of five. That's part of my OCD is math. So now you know a little bit more about me. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for this time together. And we pray that you'll use all of these things to point to yourself and that anything silly I said that doesn't need to be retained and isn't from you will be quickly forgotten. Anything that you want to speak to each man here will sink home and they'll digest it, they'll take it home with them, and they'll talk to you about what it is that you want them to learn tonight. And Lord, sometimes there isn't anything and it's just about the fellowship. Other times it'll be life-changing and help us to go through this week, this month, this year, and the rest of our lives with your discernment over what is important and what we can let go of. And help us to focus on what's important and what is your will and let go of the stuff that is trivial or it's our will. And we pray these things in the power of Jesus our Lord and Savior. Amen.